if you are paying total attention to someone, you feel deeper connections, you feel love. When we connect with other people, that's where we get our power. That's where we get our strength. That's how we can grow and transform. This is a really hard moment. Everyone is struggling, and we've got to not only be compassionate towards others, but we've got to be gentle with ourselves. Hi, Booktube. I'm Lori Gottlieb. I am a psychotherapist with a clinical practice in Los Angeles. I also write the weekly Dear Therapist column in The Atlantic. So this is my book. Maybe you should talk to someone. The book follows four very seemingly different patients. And then there's a fifth patient in the book, and the fifth patient is me as I go through my own struggle with my own therapist. I'm Dr. Vivek Murthy. I had the privilege of serving as the 19th Surgeon General of the United States during the Obama administration. And I had the opportunity during that time to go into people's living rooms and sit with people and hear about their stories. But what I didn't expect to hear were the stories about loneliness. My book is about the prevalence and the incredible consequences of loneliness to our health. But it's also a book about hope, about the power of social connections to help us heal. My name is Hemin Sinim. I am originally from uh, South Korea. I'm a Buddhist monk. I am the author of The Things You Can See On You When You Slow Down and Love for Imperfect Things. Both books are about how to find mindfulness, you know, how to find uh, gratitude and balance in our lives. Vivek and Hemin, it is so nice to chat with you today. <laughs> Thank you. Vivek, how are you spending your days? I start each day off just um, trying to get the kids, you know, you know, ready, brushing their teeth, getting them fed, and then hoping that I haven't missed a conference call in the process. A lot of my patients can't find privacy in their homes to have their sessions. So often they're having them either from a closet, but more often from the toilet. <laughs> and often they will put on a, like a blouse or a top, and they don't realize that sometimes they're angling the camera a little far down and they're wearing like their pajama bottoms. So there's been a lot of laughter over wardrobe uh, during, during quarantine. My quarantine wardrobe uh, has usually consists of a button-down shirt, plus or minus a tie, but I'm always wearing scrub bottoms. That's what's comfortable for me. At this point, it's whatever works. When I wrote my book together, people said, wait, why is a Surgeon General talking about loneliness? Shouldn't you be talking about smoking and obesity? And it's because I was finding that even before I had the chance to serve in government, when I was starting to practice medicine, I remember how many patients would come in all alone and having to deal with incredibly painful diagnoses. And I would sometimes go up to them and say, uh, is there somebody that you'd like me to call? And so often uh, the answer was no, there's nobody else to, uh, to bring in, so I'll just figure it out myself. I was finding that even though we had never talked about loneliness in our medical school classes, even though we never studied it for an exam, that it seemed to be all around us. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons why we cannot, you know, we are too afraid to reach out uh, for help is because, you know, we are afraid to become vulnerable and talk about how you really feel. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned vulnerability because so many times when we feel disconnected, we try to fill ourselves up with food or wine or too much time on the internet. A colleague of mine said that the internet was the most effective short-term non-prescription painkiller out there. So, you know, we find <laughs> all these that. ways, <laughs> right? We, and we find all these ways to try to fill ourselves up and yet they don't fill us up. We can connect at any moment with anybody. And, you know, we have to define what is connection. And it's not just texting somebody. It's not just a how are you and a brief response. It's really, I see you, I hear you, I understand you, and the reciprocity of that. Right. Technology can bring us to feel closer, but at the same time, it can um, alienate us. Technology is ultimately a tool. We can use it to deepen our connections, or we can use it to dilute and weaken our connections. It depends how we're using it.
In my research for the book, I came across a really interesting term, fubbing. And that's when we snub other people in favor of our phone. It's important for all of us to remember that there are some places that we should keep sacred, some spaces that we should protect. And those spaces in particular, it should be those where we're having face-to-face -face interactions with friends, when we're catching up with people over the phone, times where we need to give them our full attention. Five or 10 minutes of undistracted conversation where you are listening deeply, sharing openly, uh, and simply being uh, with another person can be more powerful than 30 minutes or a whole hour of distracted conversation. Absolutely. If your friends, you know, listening to you, uh, he or she will also open up and thereby you can have a much deeper relationship. Khalid Gibran is one of my favorite poets and writers. While I was a teenager, I was reading his books, you know, over and over again. I was uh, in love at that time. I had this first experience of seeing the divine through, you know, loving that person. This particular passage really spoke to me. Demonstration of love are small compared with the great thing that is hidden behind them. If you had said months ago to any of us, um, you're going to be socially distanced from people, you're going to um, sh be sheltering at home, you're going to have all of this trauma going on all around you. I think that a lot of us would have said, you know, I don't know how I could cope with that. And we also need to have some normalcy to sit alongside everything else that has been disrupted. There's certain things that we need to do to have some structure to our days. Go to sleep at the same time that you normally go to sleep. Wake up at the same time that you normally wake up. Make sure that you shower and put on actual clothes every day. And those clothes can be sweatpants, but at least it's not your pajamas. And make your bed every day because it just makes you feel human. And that is enough. I think you're doing great if you're doing that. A lot of people feel like when we're in the middle of something like a crisis or something very tragic, that we can't also experience joy. We can hold joy and pain together at the same time. I mean, it reminds me of a patient that I saw who had cancer, and she was saying that people felt so worried about laughing around her because they felt like it would somehow minimize the pain of her experience. And she said, it's not like I'm gonna forget that I have cancer. You know, it's not like any of us is gonna forget that we're going through this pandemic. You know, given the circumstance, uh, I think we can carefully look at where my mind is. You know, if we are looking at the negatives, then it feels like we are in a prison. But if you actually look at the positive side, this can be a great opportunity for you to learn. Thanks to YouTube, you can learn to knit, you can learn to cook. It's very calming and it is also a very nice way to serve, you know, because you are making it not just for me, but for my friends as well. If we are doing things for other people, uh, then uh, not only you feel good about ourselves and then have a much deeper connections, uh, but also you begin to see that your life is uh, meaningful. I mean, I love what you just said, because I think what you're pointing to is that as dark and as hard as this time is for so many people, that we can actually draw a lot of meaning out of it. And if we come out of all of this with a greater focus on people, with a greater commitment uh, to relationships, and I think that we will have responded to COVID-19 in a way that will ultimately leave us stronger. One of the great things about humanity is that we come together in moments of crisis. On September 11, 2001, when the buildings were beginning to crumble, people started fleeing but those who fled south found themselves encountering the Hudson. Now, the Coast Guard recognized that this was happening, so they issued an unprecedented call to all civilian boats in the area. Over 500,000 people were rescued from the southern tip of Manhattan. It was an extraordinary moment. But if you think about what happened, these men and women on these civilian boats were running toward the fire, literally. They didn't know what was gonna happen. They didn't know if they were putting themselves in harm's way. But what they recognized is that in those moments, there's a human need, a call to be together, to be there for each other, that rises above everything else. 
we are doing remarkably well, even if we're experiencing anxiety and sadness and um, so much loss. We are being creative, we're being adaptable, we're being flexible. And so I think that what is what I found most surprising is how strong we all are when it comes down to it. So uh, I was looking at uh, this morning, you know, how to make uh, burrito breakfast. Lori, it sounds like when this quarantine is all over that you and I need to visit Amin and uh, have a meal with him. I'm getting hungry yeah. just listening to him talk. <laughs>